Welcome back to the Healthy Orange Movie Reviews. I'm your host, Bennett Campbell Ferguson, and today I am continuing my series on the, my favorite films of the 2000s with a talk about Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy. Now, I, I first saw the Spider-Man movies after the series had begun. I saw the first one on DVD, I caught the other two in theaters. But before I had seen that first film, I only heard what other people thought, other people's reactions. I remember reading one article saying that what made the film so great was that it wasn't about Spider-Man, the superhero in the costume, but that it was about Peter Parker, his very human alter ego, the actual man who becomes the superhero. And as a young shall we say, turbulently confused seventh grader reading this, I immediately thought, what? Don't you watch a superhero movie to see the guy in the costume? Who cares about the man behind the mask? But after seeing the film, after seeing all the films, I realized that that was exactly what makes the series so absolutely fantastic. And yes, the Spider-Man movies have what is likely some of the greatest action and fight sequences of all time. But it's the it's the human element, it's the the romantic and the sincere and the down-to-earth part of it that makes the whole thing mean something. Which is why it is inev it is inevitable to begin by talking about Peter Parker, the man who becomes Spider-Man. But before we go into that, I just want to call your attention to something that I haven't really talked about before, which is beginnings. Now, I feel like that the beginning of a movie is not when the first scene starts. I feel that the, the credits and also the logos of the studio that they show before the film, I feel like that's a part of the experience, a part of the, of the film itself. And I think it's interesting how uh, how particularly integral that is in the Spider-Man trilogy. So the first film, we begin with uh, the Columbia Pictures logo, because Columbia Pictures was the studio that released the entire trilogy and continues to make Spider-Man films. And we hear the, the first sort of tense, shaky chords of Danny Elfman's score and contrast to the in contrast to the fanfare that usually begins the Star Wars films, this this music sounds kind of uncertain and nervous and minor, and it get, gives you the sense that something something terrible is about to happen. That we're not about to witness a grand and heroic story. That we're about to witness something that, frankly, seems to be laden with doom. And that continues as the music begins to speed up and the drums begin to beat and the Marvel Comics logo flashes and then we charge into the credit sequence which is an, an amazing animated uh, little bit by Kyle Cooper which is uh, has all the names of the cast and crew kind of enmeshed in spider webs and the music gets darker still and so there's there's an immediate sense of foreboding and that this is going to be an emotional story tinged with tragedy and it really masterfully sets that up in this uh, with this music and these credit sequences. And so after that we meet Peter Parker played by Tobey Maguire who is a high school senior at Midtown High and by the way not Midtown Science High as in the new Spider-Man film which uh, took complete ridiculous liberties by creating this science high school. Sorry, Peter Parker does not go to a science magnet school. He is a public school kid. Come on. But anyway, and, and that's that's a whole nother hmm, bag of spiders. So anyway, Peter Parker is uh, basically an outcast. He's a he's a good he's a good guy. He's a nice guy. He's a compassionate person, but pretty much everyone hates him. In fact, even the nerds hate him. Just for some reason, he rubs everyone the wrong way. He's constantly being bullied and beaten and picked on and etc. etc. 
and his only his only friend at school is Harry Osborne, this rich kid, played by James Franco, who is also kind of an outcast too. He's also ostracized by the rest of the school, partly because of the, they're jealous of his wealth and partly because he's kind of a geek like Peter, even though he's a bit more handsome. But I would not say that things change quickly, but early on we have what a screenwriting teacher might call the inciting incident, which is on a field trip to Columbia University, Peter gets bitten by a genetically altered spider. Yes, you heard that right, a genetically altered spider. Aside from that, the film is impressive in its realism. <laughs> but, um, but, but it, uh, it gives him the the powers of a spider. So he wakes up and and uh, suddenly he can walk on walls and suddenly he's incredibly muscular and looks like a football player. And then and he can shoot webs out of his wrists and all kinds of crazy stuff. Although the the interesting thing is the movie direct as directed by Sam Raimi does a wonderful wonderful job of uh, showing the kind of uh, excitement and horror of this transformation. So we, we get this terrific sequence in which Peter is leaping over the rooftops of New York and uh, we see him just soaring over the crevices between buildings and whooping with joy and it's, it's magnificent and glorious and in its excitement and in the realism of the way it's filmed. It, it, you believe it's actually happening. But then at the same time, there is this uh, darker undercurrent because we also see the the first night where Peter's powers are manifesting and he's lying on the floor of his room and the spider bite on his hand is like swelling up to horrific proportions and it's just, and the, the editing, it cuts, it's cut in all these disjunctive ways that disorient you and so we get the sense that this is a frightening transformation as well, which contributes to the depth of it. And this is all fine, but you may be wondering, how does Peter become a superhero? How does he get to that point where he puts on a costume and says, I want to fight crime? It's Well, he goes about it in kind of a roundabout way, not unlike Batman in Christopher Nolan's movies or uh, or any other superhero but but Peter's journey is especially unique and that it's partly motivated by his his love his crush on the girl next door Mary Jane Watson played by Kirsten Dunst and they they have they have a bond they have there's a this chemistry between them but Mary Jane has not yet come to feel about Peter the way he feels about her. So he feels like he has to impress her and he gets this idea to fight as a costumed wrestler and use his powers to win so he can make a bunch of money and buy a car to impress her. And this, uh, this goes completely spectacularly wrong. First, first of all, the the guy in charge of the wrestling match refuses to even pay him, even though he does win. And so out of spite, Peter lets, uh, lets the guy get robbed. But then, are you following this? Soon after, Peter's Uncle Ben, played by Cliff Robertson, is shot and killed by a carjacker. And it turns out that the carjacker was the same man who Peter allowed to rob the wrestling arena. And so he, he could have used his power to stop that guy, but he, uh, he allowed him to get away in order to get his revenge since he didn't get the money. And so Peter bears the responsibility of having, having essentially caused his uncle's death. And we get this magnificent, magnificent shot of him kneeling on a building above uh, above high above the city after that's happened and we just we see him in his wrestling costume but unmasked and see see the grief in his face and then it's genuinely genuinely overwhelming and 
Tobey Maguire as Peter with his his wide eyes and his uh, his his kind of weird naturalism as a performer just fills the screen with emotion. And it's it's not at this moment, but th this this moment is the beginning of how he's going to become a superhero, which is he realizes that he has an obligation to use his powers for good to protect people. And so soon after he has made a new and improved Spider-Man costume, beautifully designed by James Atchison, by the way, and he's soaring through the city and stopping robbers and all sorts of thieves and whatnot, and he's become Spider-Man. He's become this iconic hero who is spurred on by this mission of guilt and grief. But at this point, Spider-Man is not even half over. There's still quite a lot to come, and which is mainly due to the fact that out there, there is another superpower being waiting in the wings to challenge Spider-Man, which is a Norman Osborn, who is a business tycoon, who's injected himself with some kind of performance enhancer, and he he becomes the supervillain called the Green Goblin. And the the Green Goblin is essentially the the anti Spider Man, a brutal murderer who kills people without any sort of thought or or scruple about it. He's he's just on a rampage. He essentially wants power and there's there's kind of a there's kind of a, a delightfully nasty simplicity in the fact that he doesn't have a, a very deep or complex motivation. He's pure ruthlessness. And yet at the same time Willem Dafoe who plays Norman slash the goblin, he he shows us that this guy is, you know, a very normal man. So we have this uh, this kind of chilling idea of this normal guy who actually is a friend and mentor to Peter being a ruthless killer. And so much of the film revolves around the, the Peter's struggle as Spider-Man with the Goblin. And it's, uh, it's through this struggle that we end up seeing some really, really atrocious and powerful violence the, this first Spider-Man movie is uh, is actually the most violent film in the trilogy, and I think it's interesting that they uh, that Sam Raimi, as a director, didn't choose to escalate things over the series. He decided to to essentially I don't know tone it down or move away from that in subsequent films, which I I don't have a problem with that at all. I mean, the other films I think are perfect as they are. But I do think that the brutality in the first film is interesting. For example, the final confrontation between Peter and the Goblin is just incredibly, incredibly ruthless. The We get the Goblin constantly kicking and punching Peter and hitting him in the face and blood spewing through the air. And it's in this, this kind of... a this dirt on this dirty broken down building below the Queensboro bridge and it's really it's really chilling but in the midst of all this uh, all this pain and horror we get the a, a look at what really drives Peter what's driven him through this whole story which is his love for Mary Jane and the interesting thing is that Mary Jane is, I mean, she's the, she's the kind of, she's the kind of girl who any outsider nerd might develop a crush on just because she's beautiful. And she is beautiful. I mean, she's a gorgeous redhead. I mean, the, the character in the comics was famous for this uh, tagline that's not in the movie. Face it, Tiger, you just hit the jackpot. And that's not in the, that's not in the film because I think they wanted to make her more human. But it's uh, it, it sums up how someone might fall in love with her initially just because of her looks. 
But let's let's say that in the movie that's why Peter was attracted to her initially. Let's let's say that for argument's sake. Even if that is true, over time his his love for her has developed into something deeper, and he really does care about her for for who she is, which is uh, summed up really well in a scene where she says, "You know, you love me for exactly who I am, perfect, imperfect." whatever you don't need me to be someone else you care about me exactly as, as the person that that I am whenever and so that the his that that passion he feels for her that comes into play into this fight with the goblin where uh, where Peter begins to P Peter's beaten by the goblin he's been knocked down but the goblin then threatens to. He says, "You know, once I've finished you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill her. I'm gonna kill Mary Jane." And that moment, Peter just, just becomes possessed with this kind of amazing wrath. We've seen him beaten by the goblin time and time again, and yet suddenly, he he floors him in practically two moves, pulling a brick wall down on the goblin's head and then just punching him repeatedly and brutally to the point where the goblin's calling out, Peter, stop! And it's it's a magnificently powerful moment. It's romantic, it's it's dark, it's, it's adrenaline-charged and thrilling. And in another movie, the adrenaline might have been allowed to, to take over and become too much and the movie become the movie could have become too much of an ode to Peter's macho rage. But Spider Man does not that the film doesn't allow that to happen. Instead instead we get a a very somber and tragic coda in which Peter essentially essentially realizes that that he's beaten he's beaten the villain, he's won but in his battle with the goblin he's realized that because he is spider-man people he cares about will always be at risk and as that as is shown because the goblin targets his friends and family once he finds out his identity and so peter has to reconcile him to this and reconcile himself to this life of isolation and so even though the film ends with him defiantly swinging through the city on his on his web lines, shooting them from building to building and swerving above the skyscrapers like an acrobat, there's a there's a melancholy to it, and he's he's bold but a tragic hero, kind of essentially doomed to loneliness, which is a fulfillment of the the uncertainty. That's that's established by that kind of dark music at the beginning, and so when Peter ends the film by saying, "Who am I? I'm Spider-Man," it's a it gives you a charge, but it's a it's a darkly thrilling charge rather than a triumphant one.